Hello everybody, Kyle here from Web Dev Simplified. In this video, I'm going to go through all the steps that you need to take in order to set up a shopping cart using Stripe to accept payments. I'm going to go through all of the different security concerns that you need to take into account, as well as how to set up your backend server and how to set up your front end so that it's integrated properly with your backend. So let's get started now. The first thing we need to do is set up our project using NPM. If you haven't already downloaded NPM, make sure you watch my last video, which was about downloading Node, which will also download NPM for you. So to get started, all we need to do is go into our terminal and type in NPM init and hit enter, and it'll prompt you with a bunch of different questions about what project you're creating. And I'm just going to leave all of mine default, so I just need to hit enter a bunch of times to get through all of the different stuff. And as soon as I finish that, you'll see it creates a package.json file with all of the different answers to the questions that I put inside of it. This is a way where you can put all the dependencies for your project, as well as information such as the name and description of your project, so it's easier for people to understand what's going on with your project. Next, we want to download the different libraries that we're going to be using inside of this project. We have just a few libraries that we're going to use. So in order to install libraries, we just use npm install, and then we type the name of the libraries we want. In our case, we're going to be using Express, which is a framework for developing web applications in Node. We're going to be using EJS, which is our view templating language, so we can put server-side code inside of our front-end HTML views. And then we obviously need Stripe, since we're going to be integrating with Stripe, so we need the, their library as well to integrate. And then in order to save these, all we need to do is put dash dash save and hit enter, and it'll download all these different dependencies, put them inside of a folder called node modules, as you can see over here, and then inside of our package.json, you see we got a bunch of different dependencies with their versions added into here. You also see we have this lock file, which essentially just locks the version of our libraries that we've installed, so that when we deploy this, we have the exact same libraries being deployed to production as we have in our local environment. We still have one more library that we want to install, but this is going to be what's called a dev dependency, which means it's only installed when you're working in a development environment such as on your own computer, but it won't be installed in production. So in order to do that, use the same exact command and then type the name of the library that you want. In our case, we want to use .env and then just put save, but it's going to be save-dev and that'll save it as a dev dependency. And if we run that, you'll see that it'll download that dependency and add it to the dev dependencies section right here in our package.json file. And now we have all the different project components that we need in order to start building our actual project. So what we're going to do next is download our my old introduction to web development project, which I actually built the shopping cart using JavaScript, and we're going to take that shopping cart and we're going to build the back end for it so we can integrate properly with Stripe. So in order to do that, we need to just go to my GitHub account right here, introduction to web development. What we want to do is we just want to use the clone or download link. We just want to copy this using SSH in my case going to copy that and then we can just clone that library so we can just type git clone paste in that url and it'll clone that introduction to web development into our project right here as you can see and as soon as that finishes downloading i have all of the different parts of my project and in our case we want to go to introduction to javascript lesson one and these are all the different files that we ended with in the last part of my building a javascript shopping cart tutorial that i'll link in the top right corner if you're interested in checking that out if you haven't already and what we want to do is we want to copy all these files into our current project, but we want to put them inside of a folder called public. Because this project that we have right now contains both our server and our front end code. And we don't want to intermingle our front end code and our server code together. So we're going to use a public folder in order to put all of our front end facing code, such as our HTML pages, our JavaScript, and our CSS. And that's where everything that the browser can access is going to go. So let's first create a new folder called the public for us to put all this information in. And we're going to copy the fonts, images, HTML files, JS files, and CSS files from this introduction to JavaScript course. We're just going to paste that right here into the public section. Whoops, into the public here. And then once all those are in there, we can completely delete this Git repo that we cloned because we don't actually need it for our project. And now, as you can see, we have everything that that project ended with inside of this public folder here, which is exactly what we want. And now we can work on starting creating the server for our application. In order to create a server for our application, 
we want to create a new file and we're just going to call it server.js so that we know that this is our server file and this is going to be in the root of our project so we'll just say server.js right here and this is where all of our server side code is going to run and then if you've been following along with my channel you know that my last video was how to set up and create a node server and in this video we're going to do something very similar we're going to use a node server but we're going to use a framework called express because it makes doing a lot of the things that you have to manually do much easier than if you were to just do a basic node based server so what we're going to do is we're going to create a variable we're going to call it express so that we can require that express library that we need so we just type in require put in express here and this is going to require the express library into that express variable and then in order to create our app we just need to use that app variable here and we need to create this express variable that we used that we required earlier and it is just a function so we can just call this express variable since it's just a function and that'll create a brand new app for us inside of this app variable this is essentially the same thing as doing create server for the old node way of doing it just basically where you just use http.create server that's essentially what this is doing but a little bit more complex next we want to set the view engine that we're going to be using for our application and this just allows us to embed server side code inside of our front end html pages so we can just say app.set and since we want to set the view engine we just put view engine and then we put what we want to set it to and in our case we downloaded ejs so we're going to set it to ejs here and now our front end is going to be using ejs in order to render its views next we want to tell our app where all of these public front end facing files are and in our case we put them in this public folder so we just say app.use and we just need to say express which is that variable with the library express that we talked about earlier dot static so this is saying where are our static files going to be and we'll say public so this is marking all the files inside of this public folder as static and they're going to be available on the front end which is exactly what we want and now we can work on actually creating the different views for our server by making it listen so all we need to do in order to do that is just type app.listen and we can just tell it what port we want to listen on in our case we're just going to listen on port 3000 and now if we save that and run our application by typing node server.js and we go over here to localhost 3000 as you can see we have our application being run here from our public folder it's serving all of our different html files so we can navigate through this is going to be the store we're going to be working on and then we also have the about page here all of this that we created earlier and paste it into this public folder here all of it's available now because we added this line which is using that public folder as our static files now that we have this open i'm going to just give a quick demo of what our store does right now if you go into our store page and you click add to cart on any of these buttons here it'll add it down to the bottom of our cart here we can increase the quantity whatever we want to do add something else we can remove things if we don't want them and then when we click purchase it'll just give us a message saying we purchased it and remove it from the cart but it doesn't actually do any purchasing or require any credit card information and that's what we're going to integrate with stripe the way that stripe works is that when our user clicks the purchase button on our page here instead of popping up this message it's going to pop up a pop-up that allows the user to enter their credit card information there's zip code address everything that they need to enter in order to purchase these items and it'll send that information to stripe stripe will then take that information parse it and send it back to us as a unique id that we can use to reference that user's credit card information as well as their address and anything else they entered so we don't actually have to store any credit card information on our server all we needed to worry about is this id that they send us which is perfectly safe for us to store ourselves because it doesn't contain any sensitive information we then are going to send that id to our server which we created over here we're going to add roots so we can send that to our server and then from there we can use the secret key for stripe in order to send and create charges with that id which is linked to that person's credit card that way our application doesn't have to handle any of the credit card information and we aren't liable for handling any credit card information so in order to get started with that we need to sign up for stripe on their website so if you just go google for stripe go to their home page here and i've already signed in so i can just click dashboard but for you you would want to click sign up and just sign up for their account and as soon as you're done with that it'll bring you to their dashboard here and you can go down to the developer section go down to api keys 
And here is where you can view your publishable API key as well as your secret API key, which we are both going to need these for our application. The secret API key is something that you want to keep secret. You do not want to share this with anyone. You don't want to put it in your front end code. You don't want to commit it to your GitHub. It needs to stay entirely secret because if people have that API key, they can use it to charge your customers as well as charge your customers' credit cards, which you really don't want. So make sure you keep the secret key secret. The publishable key, on the other hand, you don't have to worry about keeping secret, so you can check that into your GitHub or post it down to the front end and it won't really matter. In order to make keeping these secrets much easier, we downloaded the library called .env earlier, and now I'm going to show you what that's really used for. So if we go over here into our project, and we just create a new file, we're just going to call it .env with a period, not the actual word dot, bring that into the root of our project, and in here we can put all of our different environment variables such as our secret key and our publishable key so that we don't actually have to check these into our github repository or put them in our code and then if we just create a git ignore file and we just put env inside of that git ignore so this env file will never be committed to your github account so you never have to worry about anyone seeing your public or secret keys in your github account and we can also reference these environment variables inside of our server by just using up here real quick so if we wanted to get our secret key so we want our stripe secret key all we say is process dot env and anything we put after this a variable on this object is just whatever we put inside of this environment variable so for example we can put our stripe key in here we can just call it stripe secret key set it equal to whatever value we want for example we can just set it to test for now for testing purposes and if we save that file, go back to our server.js file, and we just put that exact same thing that we typed in there. So in our case, it's going to be stripe secret key. And then to test this, we can just log out the secret key. So we can just say console.log stripe secret key, save that, and we can run our server here. And as you run it, you see that we get undefined, while we should be getting test, which is what we put in our environment variable. And that's because we need to first load our environment variables using the .env library that we downloaded. So we can end our server, and at the very top of our file, what we first want to do is we want to check to see if we are running in production environment or development environment. So we can use our process.env.nodeenv variable. And this is a variable that is going to be set by node itself that will tell you what environment you're on. And we want to make sure that we are not on production. Because as you know, we only downloaded the .env library for development. So if we're in production, we don't want to use the .env library because it won't actually exist and we're going to run into errors. So if we know it's not production, then we're safe to use this library and we can just require that .env library. And then we can call on this library, the load method, which is going to load all of the variables inside of this .env file and put them inside of our process.env variable in our server. And now, if we run our server, you'll see that we get printed out test, which is exactly what we put in our env variable here. And this is perfect because now we can hide our secret keys inside of this env variable without actually putting them in our GitHub repository or anywhere else in our server that is going to be easily accessible by other people. So now let's just copy over the secret key and the publishable key from our web application for Stripe here. So if we go over here, we can take our public key copy this and we're going to create a new variable we're going to call it stripe public key we're going to paste in that public key that we have right here and we're also going to get our secret key as well and paste that in instead of test and now we have two variables for our secret key and our public key for using stripe that we can access inside of our server here so let's create another variable for our public key and we're just going to call it public key instead of secret key and we're going to access it by accessing the public key variable instead of the secret key. And we can test that that's working by trying to print both of these out, saving and restarting our server. And you'll see that we get our secret key here first, and then our public key right after that. And that's perfect. We now have our API credentials set up for Stripe so that we can start actually using the application. But you will notice these are only test credentials. So we can actually hit the Stripe API and send it certain charge requests without actually charging any of our credit cards or other people's credit cards for real money. So we can use this for just testing, which is exactly what we want for building this application. The next thing that we're going to want to work on 
is modifying our store HTML page so that we can use it within our view templating engine of EJS. And we also want to extract all the items that are in that store onto our server so that when we tell the server which items somebody bought, we can actually reference it on the server instead of having to reference it from the front end, which would allow people to be able to fake what items they bought. For example, if we got our request back from Stripe with the token for their credit card number and everything, and then the user or the front end sent us back the amount that we needed to charge that credit card, the user could just change that amount to zero in their front end, click the purchase button, and they would be able to purchase everything for zero dollars and we wouldn't have any control over it. So instead, we're going to send the different IDs of the items that they are purchasing to the server so that they can't actually fake what they are buying. So to do that, we want to first create, in our case, we're just going to use an item.json file, items.json, in order to store all the different items on our server. And we're just using a JSON file here because it's easier than setting up a full database in order to do this. So let's open up our project real quick, go to the store page here, so we can view the different items that we need to add to our project. So as you can see, we have two sections, music and merch. So our items.json, we're going to have a music key, and this is going to be all the different music that we have for sale, so it'll be an array. And then we're also going to have a merch key, which is going to be everything else that isn't music that we have for sale, which will also be an array again. And inside of this array, we'll put all the different music. So we're going to have a name, a price, and an image name, as well as an ID that we're going to use in order to reference that. So first we'll have an ID. In our case, we'll just make this one ID number one. We're then going to have the name. The name of this one is album one. Next we'll have price. And we're going to put price using cents instead of using dollar amounts because it'll make it so that we don't have any floating point rounding errors when we are calculating our total price. So instead of putting $12.99 like that, we are going to put $1,299, and that's in pennies instead of in dollars. Then lastly, we want to use the image name, set that, and we can find this inside of the actual images folder here. And you can see we have an image called album1.jpg. So album1.png. If you save that, we now have our first music item done. And we just need to go through and do this for all of our different albums, as well as all of the different merch. So I'm just going to copy that over real quick, paste that down. We want to change the ID here to two. The name is album two. Price is $14.99. And then album two.png. Do this two more times for our other two albums. So we have album three, which is ID three. It's going to be a cost of $9.99. And then album3.png, and then finally, album4, and this one is $19.99. And then we have our merch section, which has a t-shirt and coffee cup. We're going to do essentially the exact same thing. So we used ID4 here, so this will be ID number five. The name is t-shirt, price is $19.99. And then over here, we have a shirt.png, which is the file that we used. There we go. And then lastly, we want to get the coffee cup item in here, which will be ID number six. The title right here is coffee cup. Price is $6.99. And then lastly, we have a coffee.png over here, which we can just use. And if we save that, now we have all of our items inside of this items.json, which we can actually reference and use inside of our front end code in order to make all of these different items show up and now they'll have an ID associated with them, which is perfect. So in order to access these different items inside of our front end, we first need to go into our server. So let's go to our server.js file, and we want to create a route for this store page that we created. So in order to do that, all we say is app dot, and here we want to put dot git, because we're doing a git request, which is essentially the same thing you do whenever you click on a link in a web page or type out the URL of a web page. So we're going to say dot git since we're doing a git request. And then we want to do for the route of store. So whenever someone gets the route store at the base of our thing, so if they were to type into our URL here, store, just like this, so slash then store and hit enter, it would bring them to this git request here. And as you can see, it says cannot git slash store because we haven't restarted our server yet or provided a function for this store method. So 
we're going to provide a function here. And this function is going to take our request parameter as well as the response parameter, just like in a normal Node.js server. And inside of here, we can do all of the different code that we want to do in order to send variables to our store page. So the first thing we want to do is read that items.json file that we just created. So we need to include a library in order to read that file. So up here, let's just include fs library, which will allow us to read different files. And now that we have that included, we can go down here and type in fs.read file in order to read the contents of our items.json file. And then of course that will accept a function with an error parameter if it errored out. So we can first check if there is an error. And if there is an error, we just want to set the status to 500 for our response. And then we want to end that response. And this is very similar to how we would do this using a basic node server, but it's much more streamlined. We can just call res.status to set it to 500 and then end to end our response. But of course, if there was no error, we want to actually pass down our file so we can say res.render, and in here we want to render that store page. And right now we have it saved as an HTML page. But since we want to use the values from our server in that HTML page, we need to save it as an EGS file, or EJS, sorry. And that way we can use our templating language on this. So we'll say to render store.ejs. And then after that, we want to pass it all the different variables that we want to send to that server page. So in our case, we want to send the items and in order to actually get the items, we can just say json.parse, and we can parse the data, which is the second parameter here, to our read file, which is the actual information inside the file. And since it's JSON, we just want to parse that into valid JSON, and it'll send that JSON object with the name items down to our store.html page, which we've changed the name to store.ejs. And while we're using Express, by default, all of your views that are rendered with this method here, need to live in a folder called views. So let's create a new folder, call it views here. And inside of this, we're going to move our store.html. And we're also going to change the ending of this file to be store.ejs so that we know that it's going to be our templating language of ejs. And in order to get syntax highlighting for this ejs format, you may want to install an extension called ejs language support, which I already have installed. So if you haven't done that, Try to install that now and then reload Visual Studio Code so that you get syntax highlighting for EJS. Now, back in our store.ejs file here, instead of printing out all of our shop items manually inside of our HTML, we can actually loop through that items variable that we just created. In order to do that, we just go onto a new line here. And in EJS, in order to reference a server side variable, such as that items variable, we would just need to put any code inside of this less than sign followed by a percent sign, and then end it with the exact opposite. And all of the code inside of here is going to be executed on the actual server before it gets sent to the front end client of the user. And if we put an equal sign here, it'll render whatever gets executed inside of here to the screen. But in our case, we don't want to render, we just want to actually execute. And what we want to do is we want to loop over all of the music items inside of our store. So we can say items.music.for each. And this will loop over each item and it'll have a function inside of it that'll take a single item, which is going to be each item of the music array. And then inside of this is where we are going to do a different code. And we want to print out pretty much all the information inside of here. But we need to make sure that we actually end our loop down here on the outside of our actual information that we want to return. So now, inside of this loop, we have this variable called item, which contains all the different information inside of here. We have ID, name, price, and the image name that we can use inside of our store.ejs page here inside of this loop. So instead of printing album one, instead, we can use this variable. We put the equal sign since we actually want to render this in the code. We can just say item.name, and this will get the name property from this item variable and print it out inside of our code right here which is perfect. And this is going to get printed out every single one time for each item in the music array in our items object. So it's going to get printed out four times, one for each album. Same thing here where we have the name of our image. We just need to change this to be image name. And then we have price down here. So change this to price. And since our price is in cents and we want to display it as dollars, 
we just divide by 100. And then lastly, we want to put the ID on our item here. So we're going to put it inside of a data attribute, which allows us to access this inside of JavaScript without actually putting a class or an ID. So we can just say data item ID. And we're going to set that equal to, and we need to make sure we put this in quotes, and we're going to set that to the item ID. And now we can remove all these extra shop items down here for this section for music. And as you can see, our music section now just contains this loop that goes through all the different items in that items variable. So now if we save that, make sure we save our server, end it, and restart it. And if we actually go to our store page here and hit refresh, you'll see that it renders our store page and it renders these different items exactly how we wanted it to. And to make sure that it's coming from our items.json file here, let's just change the price of album one to be, for example, 10 times more expensive. And if we save that, we refresh our store here, you'll see that it's now $129 instead of $12.99 as it was earlier. We could also change the name here, save it and refresh, and you'll see that it changes the name up here. And that's perfect. Our information for our music section is now being pulled from our items.json. All we need to do is go back into our file here and do the exact same thing that we're doing for music, but do it for the merch section as well. So let's just copy what we have here. Oh, we also need to make sure we put this div back here. I accidentally deleted the div associated with this shop items class here. So make sure I put that back in place. Copy this section. And then we can do the same thing here. We can remove all of the shop items that already exist inside of this section, just like that. And now paste in the loop. But instead of looping over all of the music, we want to actually loop over the merch. And now if I just fix formatting here, there we go. Save that. Now all of the merch and all of the music should be coming from our items array. And if we refresh it here, go into our items.json, go down to the merch section. Let's change t-shirt to be t-shirt test. And if I scroll down, refresh, you should see it says t-shirt test, which means now our merch section is also being pulled from our items.json. And now we can add, remove, or edit all of our JSON items inside of this file here without actually having to modify our server or our front end side code in that EJS file, which is perfect. Let's change this back. So it's just t-shirt, refresh page, make sure it actually works. And there we go. Our store is exactly the same as it was before. You see, if we hit add to cart, everything works as it did before. So nothing has actually changed functionality wise, but we are now rendering our items from the server side, which means our server has total control over what items our front end uses. And it also has total control when we send back the different items the person purchases in order to determine the total price that we actually charge the user's credit card. So they can't actually fake it by telling us it's a $0 charge because the server will know that these items don't add up to $0. Now that we finally have our server set up, and our front end code setup and working together, we can get working on integrating Stripe into our application. In order to do that, let's go over to our store.ejs page and we need to import some new script tags into this page in order to get the Stripe API into our page. So let me just copy over here real quick the Stripe script, which you can find on Stripe's website, and it's just checkout.stripe.com slash checkout.js. And we want to defer this script since we need this script to be loaded before the rest of our scripts because our store.js script is going to depend on that. So we must also change that to defer since we need the checkout script to load first. Then we want to create another script tag here. And instead of actually loading in an external script, we're just going to use some inline JavaScript in order to set the Stripe publishable key that we created earlier. So we'll just create a variable. We'll call it Stripe public key. And we're going to set it equal we're going to use that EJS syntax that we talked about with the less than in the parentheses and the equal to actually output this content. And we want to set it to the Stripe public key, which we need to send from our server. So we'll just say Stripe public key. And there we go. Now that variable will be set, but we actually need to send it from our server first. So on our server.js, we're sending items. So let's also send a variable called Stripe public key. And there we go. Now, if we save that, we're actually sending the Stripe public key from our server down to our store.ejs, and we're setting it as a JavaScript variable here so that we can access it inside of our client side JavaScript. 
which is where we are going to start working on next. So instead of our store.js page, we need to find the section for where we are adding items. Here we go, we got purchase clicked, and we need to change all of this functionality so that when we click on the purchase button, it's going to call Stripe, and then Stripe is going to call us back and say, okay, that's valid, and then we can call our server, and our server is going to do all of the checkout information that we need to do. In order to get that set up, we need to just create a variable anywhere, or we'll just call it Stripe Handler, and this is going to be a variable that will handle our Stripe interactions. So we're going to use a object called Stripe Checkout, which is coming from that library we imported earlier from Stripe. And then we want to configure this so that we can send it the actual information that we need. The first thing that we need to send it is our key, which we also set as a JavaScript variable. We called it Stripe Public Key. So this is going to be the key, the publishable key from our Stripe profile that we sent from our server to our front end view page, and now we can access it in our front end JavaScript. We then want to tell it what locale to use, which is essentially what language to use. And we're just going to set this to auto, so it'll automatically set the Stripe pop-up box language based on where the current user is or what their locale is set to. And then we're going to have a function here, which is going to have the attribute token. And this function takes a single parameter called token. And inside of this function, is where we need to put all the information for how we want to respond when Stripe sends us back information. So this token function is going to be called after the person clicks the purchase button, fills out all of the checkout information like credit card number and clicks purchase. It'll get sent to Stripe and then when Stripe verifies everything, they will send it back and call this method for us. So for now, we're just going to leave this method completely blank and work on doing other things that we need to do inside of our price purchase clicked button here. So let's just configure this so that everything looks right. There we go. So now we just have this empty function and inside of purchase clicked, we actually want to call this Stripe handler. So let's just comment everything out that's in here currently for now. And we can say Stripe handler dot open and this is going to open that pop-up box that I talked about and all we need to do is set the amount that we want to have so we're going to create some price variable which we're going to set to the amount inside of the stripe handler in order to create this price variable what we want to do is we want to get the price from our actual HTML that we are calculating already in our shopping cart so in order to do that we'll just create a variable called price element and we're going to set this to the document got get elements by class name and the class name of this is cart total price and we just want to get the first element and this is where our total amount is saved but it has a dollar sign in the name so we want to remove that dollar sign so we'll just set the price is going to be equal to parse float since parsing float is going to convert that number into a floating point number so it's going to take our string and convert it to a floating point number so we can do arithmetic on it and we want to use the price element. We want to get the text inside of that price element. We want to replace all the dollar signs inside of that text to just be an empty string. So that way we remove the dollar signs from the text before we actually parse it into a float. And then this is in a decimal format. So $12.99 would be 12.99, but Stripe expects it to be in cent format. So 12.99 should be 1,299. So we just need to multiply this by 100. And now this price variable is going to be set to the actual price that we need to have. So now let's restart our server real quick so that we get all of our server changes. If we refresh our page here, scroll down and we click this purchase button, you'll see that we actually get a Stripe pop-up here where we can enter our email, card number, month, year, all the information that you need for a credit card. And then we can click pay. And if we actually fill out this information, It'll send this to Stripe, send it back to us, and it'll call that token function with the token related to all the credit card and email information for that user. In order to test that, we can just put any email that we want in here. So we just put some fake email. To use a test credit card number, we just want 42 repeating, which is the test credit card number for Stripe. And you can give it any date and month that is in the future, as well as any verification number here that you want. And if we click pay, it'll send off to the Stripe server and it'll send back and call this token function. 
So in order to test that, let's just put a log in here and we'll just log this token variable inside of this token function. We'll refresh our page, go back through the purchase process again, put that card number of 42 over and over again, time that's in the future. If we click pay, there we go. And if we just wanna check the console, so if we inspect here, go over to the console tab, you'll see that we got this object printed out, which is the token object. I'll zoom that in so you guys can see it. You'll see it's got card information, it's got IP information, email information, ID, everything that you need. But the, really the only thing we're concerned with is the ID because that's what we need in order to charge the user tied with our secret key. So if we send our secret key and the ID, we can actually charge the user whatever amount that we want. So let's work on actually making this token function call our server with this token ID so we can actually charge the user for the items that they purchased. So we can get rid of this console.log here. And the first thing we want to do is we want to get all of the items that the user purchased. So when they click add to cart, we have you know the coffee cup item here, for example, we have price, we have quantity, and we want to get the IDs of all these different items. So what we need to do is we actually need to add the ID down here in this item section when we click the add to cart button. So we just need to find the section where we're adding items to the cart. Let's make this full screen. And you see we got add to cart clicked. And we want to pass the ID to this add item to cart function as well. So we're just going to also pass the ID. And the ID is going to come from the shop item. We created that data attribute called item ID. So we can just say data set, which accesses all of the properties on HTML that are prefixed with data hyphen. So they start like that, data hyphen. And we created one called item ID. But since JavaScript uses camel casing, this will be written as item ID. And this data set item ID will access the property right here of data item ID on our HTML attribute. So we now have the ID of the item that we sent in our HTML earlier. Now we can go to our add item to cart, put that ID property in there. And then inside of our cart, we just want to put that ID as a property. So cart row, we're going to use data set again, and we're going to set the item ID equal to the ID that we pass in. And now the ID of our item is going to be saved in the cart so that when we access all of our rows, they will all have IDs linked to them. So if we go back up to where we are creating our token function, we can work on starting to get all the different items for our shopping cart that are currently added there, as well as the quantities, because we need to send both of those items to the server so it can calculate the price. So let's create a variable, we'll just call it items, and it's just going to be an empty array to start out with. And then we want to get the section that contains all of our items. So the items container, cart items container, this is going to be equal to the document dot get elements by class name. And we just have a section called cart items. So inside of this cart items is going to be all of our different cart items. And we want to get the rows inside of those cart items. So we can just create another variable called the cart rows. We can set that to the cart items container dot get elements by class name. And inside of here, we want to get all the different elements that have the row or the class cart row. Now we can just loop through all of these. So we can just say for everything from i equals zero, i is less than cart rows dot length, i plus plus. So we're just looping through all of our different cart rows here. Create another variable inside of here for our individual cart row. And we'll just set it to cart rows of the ith element, which is perfect. So now we have our actual cart row inside of this loop, and we can work on abstracting the quantity as well as the ID for each item and add that into our items array that we just created that's empty right now. So the first thing we want to do is get the quantity element. We're just going to set that equal to cart row dot get elements by class name. And this class is called cart quantity input. And this is the input element on our page which actually contains the information for the number of cart items that they added. And since we just want to get the first one, we're just going to use the first element in that array. And now we want to actually change that string or get the value from that element. So we can say quantity is equal to quantity element dot value. And this gets the value of our input, which is whatever they put inside of the quantity selector right here. So in this case, it would be one, two, three, etc. So 
Now we can work on getting the actual item ID as well. And we just set that item ID on the cart row. So we can say the ID is equal to cart row dot data set dot item ID, which we just created. And now we have the ID of the item as well as how many of that item they want to purchase. So we can just add this to our items array. So we can say items dot push, which adds an element to the array. We just want to add an object with the ID set to the ID and the quantity set to the quantity. And there we go. We now have at the end of this for loop, an array of items with all the different items in our shopping cart with the ID for them and the quantity for them, which we can now send to our server along with the ID from this token element here. So in order to send information to our server, one of the easiest ways is to use something called fetch, which allows us to either send requests out to servers and get back information asynchronously so we don't actually have to refresh the page and the user can stay on the same page and it'll send the information and then as soon as the information gets back to us, it'll do something with it, whether it's an error or not. So we just want to fetch a certain URL. And to do that, we type in the fetch command and we first pass it the URL that we want to send to. And in our case, we want to send to purchase URL, which is just going to be a route on our server that we're going to create later for handling purchases. And then after that, we need to set all the different properties for this purchase fetch. So we want to do a post request because in HTML and HTTP, a post request is what you do when you want to send information to the server and have the server do certain calculations on it. And a get request is when we send information to a server and we want to get back information. So we're just going to set the method here to post, which is going to be in all capitals. And then since we're sending JSON information to the server, we need to tell the server that we're sending it JSON information. So inside of the headers here, we want to set the content type. And this is very similar to how you would have to set up a basic Node.js server to tell it you're sending JSON. So we'll say that we want to send JSON, which is using application slash JSON as the type. And we also are going to receive JSON from the server. So we must also make sure we put accept and that we put application slash JSON. So now this tells the server we're going to be sending it JSON and that we're going to receive some JSON from the server. And then lastly, body is going to be all the information that we send to the server and we can actually access this information inside the server. So what we want to do is we need to call the json.stringify method in order to make this JSON object into a string so that we can send it to the server. And then inside of the JSON object right here, we're just going to put all the different information we want to send to our server. So we first want to send that token ID, we'll call it stripe token ID, and that is just the token dot ID. And this is how we're going to charge this person's credit card. And then we want to send the items that they want to purchase. We'll just send that as items. So now we're actually fetching to the server. And right now we're not handling what happens when we get the fetch back, but that's okay. Let's go into our server.js file and create that new route. So we're going to do something very similar to how we have this get request set up. So let's just copy this, paste it down here, and we're going to just remove everything in the else statement here because we are going to need to get information from the items.json array that we created in our JSON object so that we can determine which items the user is actually purchasing. But for now, let's just log something out so that we know that we're actually getting a request coming here. So we'll just say console.log purchase. And then we want to change this to be post instead of get since we're sending a post request. And this is going to be purchase since that's the URL we're actually sending to. Restart our server here. And if we go over and refresh our page, add something to our cart, say we want three of them, and we click purchase, fill out all this information again. Make sure you use that test credit card number and a date that's in the future. And if we click pay, it'll send it to the server. And it actually did not send it to the server. So in order to debug this, we'll just go into inspect here and go over to our console. And you see that cart rows is not defined. So let's go over to our store.js, open this up bigger. And inside of here, looks like I misspelled cart row here, as well as I misspelled cart row here. So now if I say that corrected all of my spellings, oops, got one more spelling here, cart rows. So now 
all of my stuff is spelled correctly. Go over, refresh this page, add something to the cart, increase the quantity, fill out all this information again. Very tedious. Click pay. Now we should see that we're actually getting a message logged. Perfect. It says purchase inside of our server here, which means that our code called this fetch request here, sent it all of our information to our server, and now we logged this console.log purchase here, which means we're inside of this else statement here, which is perfect. That's exactly where we want to be. And inside of here, we can actually charge this Stripe user using that token, as well as the items that we sent up to the server. In order to do that, we need to take the items.json data and convert that into an actual JSON object we can use. So we can just create a variable here. We're just going to call it const items json equals json.parse data. So now we have all of the data from our items.json in this variable. And since we have two properties of merch and music, and we just want to search both of those, we're just going to create a single array called items array. We're going to set it to items.json dot music, which is all of the music items, and we're going to concatenate that array. So combine that array with items JSON dot merch. So now all of our merch and music items are in this single items array here, which we can use for finding all of the different items by ID. Next, we want to create a total variable. And we're just going to default this total variable to zero because at the beginning we have zero and we're going to loop through all the items that the server sent up and actually parse them. So we're going to do that by accessing the body, but in order to access JSON from the body, we need to first tell Express that we're using JSON. So up here in our app section, we just want to add an app.use, and we're going to say express.json. And this essentially just tells our app that we can parse the body element as JSON and access the different properties on our body as if it was just a JSON object. So now if we go back down here into our purchase section, we can just create request.body.items, and by using that express.json up above, we're able to just access the items property from the body. And this items property is exactly what we sent up here inside of this body. So we can just say items, we can loop through all the items, so we can say for each, and this is just going to take the property. So for each item in that items array, what we want to do is we want to find the item object. So we'll just set a variable here. We're going to call it item JSON. And it's going to equal the items array, which we have all of our items from our JSON file inside of. We're going to do a find. So we're going to try to find the item inside that array, which we call i. And we're going to return i.id equals item.id. So whenever this returns true, it'll return whichever item it is on inside the loop. So when the ID of the item in this array equals the ID of the item in the request body that we sent up, it's going to output the JSON for that item. So we're going to be able to access the price of that item. And then all we want to do is we want to increment the total. So we're going to take the total. We're going to increment it by item.json.price times item.quantity. Oops, this should be times. There we go. And this quantity we also sent up inside of our thing here. As you can see, we added the quantity property to each of our items. So this will take the quantity of items that they purchased, multiply it by the price, which is on our server, so they can't fake this price, and it will add it to our current total variable. So then after the end of this loop, our total variable will contain the total price that we want to charge to the user's credit card. Now we need to create a Stripe variable that is going to be for accessing the Stripe API. So if we go up here, we can just say const Stripe. We're going to require that Stripe library that we created earlier. And this is just another function that we need to pass our secret key to in order to actually activate the API. So this Stripe variable is now going to be usable for actually charging the user's credit card. So if we go down here, we can just say Stripe, which is that variable we just created, dot charges, dot create. And this is so that we can create a charge. We need to give it the amount, which we know is our total variable right here. And this amount is going to be in pennies because that's what we put it instead of our items.json here, which is exactly what Stripe is expecting. It wants pennies instead of dollar formatted for its amount. So that's perfect. We have our amount. We need to give it a source 
And this source is just the token ID that we sent up. So we can say request request.body.stripe token ID. And this is the ID that we're going to be charging. And then we just want to tell it what currency we're charging in. And in our case, we're just charging in US dollars. So we'll say USD. And now we're actually creating a charge, but we want to handle what do we do when that charge comes back successfully and what happens when that charge comes back as a failure. So in order to do that, this create is returning what's called a promise. And a promise allows you to do something after the promise is complete or to catch any errors that happen. So the first case that we want to handle is if it successfully occurred. So if create successfully occurred and after it calls the Stripe API and sends it back at the response, it's going to call whatever this then function has inside of it. So we're going to create a function here instead of then, and this will be called if our create was successful. So we're just going to log out here so that we can see this in our server. We're going to say charge successful. And then we also want to respond some JSON back to our server. So we'll say res.json. This allows us to send JSON to the server or to the front end, I'm sorry. And we just want to send a message back that says successfully purchased items. And this is just a message that we can show to the user to show them that we successfully were able to make a charge on their credit card. But if there's an error, we want to catch that error using the catch function. So again, we're just going to pass it a function. And we want to again, log out that there was a problem. So we'll just say charge fail here instead of success. And then we want to send an error code. So we'll say status of 500, which means that there's an error on the server and end that response. And that's everything we need to do on the server in order to actually charge the Stripe API and get back the different items that we purchased to the user. So let's end our server down here, restart it, and go back to our store.js because now we want to handle the response from this fetch request, which again, this is using a promise so we can use the same then and catch format that we talked about earlier. So if it was successful, we'll say then, and again, we have a function, and inside of this function, we have the response from the server, which is JSON. So we need to convert this to JSON. So we'll say we want to return res.json, and this is just telling the then function that we have a bunch of information being returned from the server, but I just want the JSON of it, and I want you to return that JSON. And we need to use another then because this works just like a promise again. And instead of here, this is going to be the actual data that is being responded from our server. So here we can use that alert message that we had in our purchase click down here where we alerted just a blank message. We can alert data.message, which is the message the server is sending us. And then we can do all of the cleanup here to actually delete the items from the cart, which is what this code is doing. So let's just paste that in there. So if it's successful, it'll alert a message to the user and remove all the items from their cart, which is perfect. But if it was unsuccessful, that's where we're going to do our catch, which comes back with an error object. We're just going to log that error because, and we'll actually do council.error, which will log it in red text instead of normal black text, because we don't really have any way that we want to handle this error and it's not really part of this tutorial. So we're just logging it out so that we can see this error. So now if we go here, refresh our page, let's say we want to buy a t-shirt and this album right here, and we want two of the t-shirt. So we should get $59.97 charge, click on purchase, fill out all the information here one last time, hopefully. There we go. And if we click pay, we should see that it says purchase successful over here on the left. Charge successful, perfect. It says successfully purchased items inside of our actual client, which means that we called in here, we called our server.js, went through all of this code, it was successful, so it logged charge successful, sent this message back down into our client, we converted it to JSON, alerted it to the user, and as soon as we click OK on that alert, it's going to clear out our cart. So let's click OK, and as you can see, our cart completely emptied itself, and we actually created a charge in Stripe. And we can even see that if we go to our Stripe dashboard here, we go to payments, you can see that we have this $59.97 payment in our dashboard. You can ignore this old payment here. This was just when I was running through the tutorial creating it, I created this payment. But this $59.97 payment with that email address that we typed in, this is the exact payment that we created 
in our page here, and we could do it again. Let's do a 699 payment, put in an email, and we're just going to say test at gmail.com. So we know that it's that email. Don't want to verify anything. Fill out all this information one last time. Click pay. We should get that alert again telling us it was successful. We can go to our dashboard here, and we should have a 699 payment showing up. And there we go, we have our 699 payment showing up in our dashboard. That's all we need to do to set up Stripe to charge people's credit cards. If you're confused about any of the code, make sure to ask me down in the comments below or view my GitHub repository with all of the code from this tutorial. Also, make sure to check out my video of where I created the front end of this JavaScript shopping cart, which is going to be linked over here. Thank you guys very much for watching, and have a good day.